We've been talking a lot about the threat of Islamic terrorism. But of course, as we know now, Islamic terrorism does not exist. There's no such thing as Islamic terrorism. A Muslim terrorist or a terrorist rather who happens to be Muslim takes a machete to a bunch of people or he blows himself up or he drives a truck over a number of people and of course he's just suffering from psychiatric problems. It's not Islamic terrorism. It's just terrorism by terrorists who happen to be Muslim. That's really what we're up against here. We're, this is a national security panel and the core part to winning a war, and this is very much a global war. It's not just in the United States, it's not just in Europe, it's not just in Australia, it's a global conflict. It stretches across every hemisphere. It's here in America, it's here in South America, it's here in North America, it's in India, it's in Australia, it's in Canada, it's in Israel, it's in Africa, it's in Asia, it's everywhere. The key part to winning a war is to recognize that the war even exists. If you don't recognize that the war exists, then you can't win it. Now, a number of speakers, and there have been a lot of fantastic speakers, have, asked, have said, some have said, we're winning this war. Others have said, we're losing this war. I'd like to offer my own prescription. We're winning this war. I know that might be a strange idea right now, because after all, it doesn't look like we're winning this war. There are constant terrorist attacks. Every few days, every few weeks, there's another attack. There's another explosion. You know, I have a friend, and she's a bit more sensitive to this sort of thing, so when she asked me, did something happen? And I told her, well, there was, there, there was something that happened, and that happened to the UK, and she says, oh my goodness, what happened there? And I said, well, there was a man who handed out balloons, and he handed out balloons to five or six people in London, and most of them survived the experience, because you kind of have to soft pedal it sometimes. Of course, he wasn't handing out balloons, he was stabbing people with a machete. So it seems like a far-fetched idea to say that we're actually winning this war. There's, a bunch of, there's, there's yet another Muslim terrorist attack, and the media jumps into action and informs us, of course, this has absolutely nothing to do with Islam. He has a history of psychiatric problems, which is, of course, the new excuse. It used to be that he was a lone wolf. Then it turned out there were entire herds of these lone wolves roaming the cities of Europe and America. So now it's every terrorist has a history of psychiatric problems. And you know, of course, in the American context, the Western context, somebody stabbing people because Allah told them to is obviously crazy. In the Islamic context, he's just a devout Muslim who believes in Allah and who follows the words of the Quran. But you know all these lies, other speakers have mentioned them, I'm not going to repeat them. I'm going to talk about the question of why we're winning this war. And to do that, I'm going to ask you to switch around your entire way of thinking. As counter-jihadists, we spend as much time fighting the big lie, the ones that I just mentioned, the one that Islam isn't a problem, that there might be a tiny minority of extremists who have misunderstood Islam. They read the Quran upside down and decided that peace really meant war and love really meant murder. That big lie, we throw ourselves against the lie, we try to beat it down. But the good news is this lie, this lie is dying. It's dying with every single Islamic terrorist attack. It's dying with ISIS, it's dying with Iran. To understand why, we have to understand what the lie is. The lie is denial. It's an effort to stop the inevitable. The inevitable is the clash of civilizations. It's the clash between Islam and the free world. Think of the bank executive who's embezzling money to feed his cocaine habit, and he makes every possible excuse. Where did the money go? He comes up with a new excuse, and he comes up with a second excuse. Think of the cheating husband. His cheating becomes more and more obvious, so he makes up more and more excuses to explain to his wife. But you know, the inevitable is coming there. This is just a temporary delaying tactic. The excuses that we're hearing, the big lie, it's a temporary delaying tactic. Because they know that they're going to get caught. And I'm talking about the bank executive, the cheating husband, the media, the entire political system that really puts multiculturalism, puts this kind of left-wing agenda ahead of national security. They're going to get caught, and they know it. And their lies are just an attempt to buy time before everybody wakes up to what's going on. The media excuses for Islamic terrorism, their way to buy time. They're buying Islamic terrorists another year or another decade before everything is out in the open. And we know how this works because this has happened before. Before World War II, they used every excuse to prevent the free world from doing anything about Hitler. Germany was the victim in World War I. Hitler was just trying to turn things around. Hitler is actually a moderate. Newspapers at the time said that Hitler was a moderate. He was part of the moderate wing of the Nazi party. Hitler was a moderate, just like the Muslim Brotherhood is a moderate. And the Muslim Brotherhood actually kind of likes Hitler. But they didn't prevent the war because they couldn't prevent the war because the war wasn't in their hands to prevent. England wasn't a problem. America wasn't a problem. Hitler was the problem. Today, we're not the problem. The Muslim world is the problem, and the Muslim world is going to see it, that the war comes no matter what excuses are made, no matter how many times they blame psychiatric problems, lone wolves, 
failure to integrate or the otherwise, none of that is going to change the inevitable. There is an inevitable conflict here. The conflict is coming. They couldn't prevent the war once, it was, once Hitler invaded. The Muslim terrorists are invading. There's no question that we are going to have to fight them. The only question is how much time will it take? How much damage will they do before we are actually free to fight back? That's the big question here. That's the $64,000 question. That is what is at stake here. And to do that, we're going to have to decide what the odds are. How many countries will the jihad take over before we're free to fight back? How many of us will be murdered in Muslim terrorist attacks in the coming years? The lies that we're seeing, the ones that we're discussing, they're not the cause, they're a symptom, they're a reaction. And the lies, the ones that are referenced by many of the other fine speakers today, they actually get worse as the problem gets worse because the harder it is to deny something, the more extreme the denial becomes. There are desperate effort by the deniers, the deniers of Islamic terrorism, the deniers of Islam, the defenders of the failed multicultural model to stop the inevitable clash of civilizations. Now to many of you, and I understand this completely, it might look like the bad guys are winning. We're isolated, they control the media. When you turn on the television, when you turn on CNN, you hear them in the media, you don't hear us, you don't hear amazing people like Robert Spencer, or Stephen Coughlin, or any of the others, or Frank Gaffney, being interviewed. Instead, you see the same old excuses, the same old explanations there. It looks like they're winning. They're in control. But they're losing, and they know they're losing. That's why their lies are getting desperate, because this is the key point. As Muslim terrorists gets worse, we rise and they fall. And the bad news is that Islamic terrorism is going to get worse. And the good news is that it's going to get worse. <laughs> I'm not confused. The two are one and the same. Think about it. America isn't weak. How come we can't be the terrorists? Why are we still fighting and dying a bunch, against a bunch of people who are using, in many cases, pickup trucks? Are we really unable to defeat them with our huge military machine? As much as it's been weakened by Obama, we can defeat them. We're not weak, we're indecisive. The terrorists shock us, then they play on our sympathies. They disguise themselves, they walk among us, and when they get caught, the media says they're misunderstood. They have psychiatric problems, their own wolves, their mothers didn't love them, they don't have enough Prozac to deal with all their psychiatric problems. <laughs> Maybe we should just airdrop tons and tons of Prozac across Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Libya and Yemen, and that will solve the terrorism problem. The, the fact of the matter is, the stronger the terrorists become, the weaker they actually get. Their greatest strength is their weakness. In our society, monsters who claim to be weak, oppressed or misunderstood, get away with murder. When they take off their masks and stop pretending to be victims and come out of the closet as oppressors, that is when they become truly vulnerable. ISIS, for example, is the next step in Islamic terrorism. It's the Islamic terrorism that goes beyond suicide bombings or flying planes into buildings. It's the kind that actually goes to phase three of Islamic terrorism, and it does operate in, phase, in three phases. Now, in phase one, the terrorists work within the civilian population, and they strike for maximum shock value. So they hit us hard, there's a suicide bombing, they blow up a bus, even they hijack airplanes and ram them into buildings. Those are all phase one terrorist attacks. Their goal is to shock us, their goal is to undermine us, because in the long term, what their plan is, it was when the society is weak enough that they can take over and control territory, and they want to control territory. They're not just out to occasionally blow something up. They want to actually take over. Now, that's what ISIS actually did in Iraq. They hit Iraqi authorities hard. They, hit, they kept doing these shock attacks. You saw them on the evening news, and there would be a suicide bombing to kill 30 Iraqi police officers, a suicide bombing um, destroys a, an Iraqi military outpost, and we just sort of had it in the back of our heads for years and years, and eventually they, their shock tactics were so effective that they were actually able to take over entire cities. The Iraqi military, the police, effectively collapsed. This was the objective. This is what they did in Iraq and Syria. This is what they would like to do in Europe. This is what they want to do here for that matter. This is what they're aiming for. This is phase two. And then, if they can take over entire cities in Europe, then instead of no-go zones, you have no-go cities. And there are parts of Europe where they might even be able to do it, and that would be their worst possible mistake. Our greatest weakness and their greatest strength is that we are divided. The defenders of Islamic terrorism in the West, Muslim and non-Muslim, can always offer excuses for Islamic terrorism. There are always reasons why we can't hit them hard. It's just going to make matters worse. Um, they're just poor people suffering from psychiatric problems. They're deprived. Um, they're just oppressed by the tyrants that we supported. There are always excuses. But the stronger Islamic terrorists become, the more those excuses run out. 
And the stronger they become, their strength is never going to match our own, no matter how big they get. You saw how quickly we were able to crush ISIS, which was supposed to be the uber Islamic terrorist group, and yet they crumbled. They crumbled because their strength on the battlefield is never going to match our own. And it's just history. When, they, when enemies take us on directly instead of trying to subvert us, and Islam is very much a subversive ideology, then they lose. Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and the USSR were strongest when they didn't confront us directly. They went down to defeat once they made the mistake of coming out into the open. Without Pearl Harbor, Japan would have ruled Asia. If Germany hadn't declared war on us, Hitler might have been able to hold on to big parts of Europe. The USSR won its biggest victories when it was pretending to be our ally. But the moment it turned on us, the end began. It took a while, but that was when the end began. Because you know what? Americans were Americans. We are very nice people. We like the underdog. We want to give the other guy the benefit of the doubt. Lots of Americans liked Uncle Joe Stalin. He had a great mustache. They thought maybe Hitler had a point about Germany being the victim in World War I. And Germany, well, Western colonialism in Asia was a real problem. Maybe the Japanese have a point too. Hitler, the communists in imperial Japan, like Muslims today, had a very good thing going. And then they blew it. Now Muslim supremacists are making the same mistake. They're not victims, they're supremacists. And supremacists might pretend to be weak for a while. Hitler pretended to be weak for a while. Germany is battered, we can't really do anything. Just leave us alone. But they ultimately, they want to show us how strong they are. That's why they're supremacists. They want to show us that they are strong and we are weak. That is the essence of Islam. Islam gets its religious affirmation from demonstrating that Islam is stronger than all other religions. That's the meaning of Allahu Akbar. Islam gets its theological justification not from anything spiritual, but from winning victories over non-Muslims. And you have the praise of Allah Akbar that traces back to Muhammad's massacre of Jews. Allahu Akbar, because we're winning the battle, because we're massacring the Jews, that proves that Allah is stronger than the Jewish God. It's stronger than all the other gods. When a Muslim kills you while shouting Allahu Akbar, he's saying, I'm killing you, therefore this proves that my religion is correct, because Allah is stronger than your God. That is exactly the whole theological underpinning of Islam. If Muslims are not strong, then their religion collapses. Now, everything that Islamic terrorists do, every horror they commit, is about showing us how strong they are. Violence is their theological justification. It's their proof of their supremacism. And like all the bad guys before them, they mistake our empathy for weakness, and then they move in for the kill. This is the trajectory of Islamic terrorism. So phase one is shock terrorism, phase two is the insurgency. Organized forces begin seizing control of territory. They take over entire cities and impose Islamic law. You've seen ISIS do this. Phase three is the Islamic State. ISIS is an example, no. but so is Saudi Arabia. We've forgotten just how the Saudis won, and there was a whole lot like the way ISIS won. Where it's when terrorists win that they are at their most vulnerable. Islamic terrorism of the kind we've gotten used to it's easy. Put on a bomb vest and blow yourself up. It's not that hard. Even an idiot could do it, especially an idiot could do it. <laughs> What's hard is actually controlling territory. That's when you're vulnerable. That's when you can't hide among civilians. You have to be out in the open. You can't just use human shields when you have an army, and you need to turn money into services. You have to do all the hard work of government, even if you do them as badly as Governor Brown. A cell of, <laughs> a cell of three people somewhere in New Jersey is very hard to disrupt because you don't know about it. Secrecy is the second greatest weapon of Islamic terrorists. It goes out the window when they have a state. Victimhood becomes much harder. It's why the PO and Hamas don't really want a Palestinian state. They want to demand one until the camels come home, and they want to blame Israel because they don't have one. But actually having a state means having responsibility. You get treated like a country, and you get bombed like a country. The best weapon that the enemy has isn't its firepower. It's not even WMDs. It's willful blindness in our society. It's a narrative which says that the terrorists are a tiny minority of extremists, and if we reach out to the moderate majority, everything will work out. But here's the problem. When you have constant terrorist attacks, then that's really a very big, tiny minority. When you have attacks day in, day out, week in, week out, then the whole tiny minority of extremist excuse is under too much pressure and begins to collapse. Now, in war, your own weakness often matters than the other side's strength. Our weakness is that they will want to be the nice guys. Their weakness is that they want to be the tough guys, and they don't have the strength to actually support that. Our weakness keeps us from finishing the fight, but their weakness neutralizes our weakness. The greatest threat to the victory of Islamic terrorists comes from Islamic terrorists. They make it impossible for themselves to win because they don't understand us, and we don't beat them because we don't understand them. And the cycle plays out a lot. We see it in Israel, we see it with America and the Middle East. We think that a compromise can be achieved, but that myth just drives the cycle of violence. The enemy doesn't want to compromise, they want to win. We're a cooperative society. They're a hierarchical society. So when Muslims immigrate to America, 
We want new people to come in and contribute, enrich the fabric of our diversity, it's wonderful. But when they come in, they want a hierarchy. And they examine the hierarchy and they say, there's no hierarchy, we want to be on top of this hierarchy. We want to take over. The two are just not compatible when the cooperative society starts committing suicide when it tries too hard to cooperate and compromise with an enemy that just wants to take over. Now the enemy grows in strength by pretending to be weak while we wait for a compromise until the enemy makes it obvious to us, as Hitler did, that there will never be a compromise. No amount of Munich Accords, no amount of surrender, no amount of appeasement, no amount of community uh, coordination with Islamic groups is going to work. And that's when things get ugly because then the lie starts coming apart. It's easy to promise that Hitler isn't a threat when he's just making noise in a beer hall. It's harder when he's invading Poland. If your whole identity is tied up in claiming that Islam isn't a threat, then the th worse the threat becomes, the harder you have to lie. And when the lies aren't enough, you have to censor and you have to criminalize. You have to put people in jail. You have to lock people up just for telling the truth about Islam because the lie is coming apart. That's where Europe is, as some of today's courageous speakers have told us. It's where Australia ended up. It's where America is heading. And don't kid yourself, they will begin locking up people here if they get the chance. You've seen it with the innocence of Muslims. Like the bosses of the Soviet Union, they will go to the wall before they lose. But the important thing is that they will lose. The entire narrative is built on hiding the truth. Don't talk about Islamic terrorists who create them. Don't call ISIS Islamic. Pretend that we can compromise our way to some settlement. Blame Israel. Blame Islamophobia. Blame anyone who tells the truth about Islamic terrorism. And it's a very impressive facade that when you watch politicians and the entire media reciting the same talking points day in and day out like lobotomized parrots, it's daunting. But this is what's going on behind the curtain. The big lie is dying. Everything you see, the foreign policy of this administration, is an effort to keep the lie alive at any cost, and they failed over and over again. Withdrawing from Iraq, the Arab Spring, negotiating with the Taliban, the Iran deal, everything they've done only accelerated the process they were trying to suppress, the clash of civilizations. So the good news is that we're going to win, not just on the battlefield, but we, and I mean those of us in this room, are going to win the war of ideas. We're going to win because the process of getting there will destroy the big lie. Every victory by Muslim terrorists brings the day of truth closer. The same thing is going to happen in Europe, it's going to happen in America, it's happened already in Israel. It'll take longer here, it'll take longer here in America than it did in Europe. You're already seeing it happen in Europe. But when you see all the denial around you, this is the important thing to remember. No lie, no spin, and no scam can beat reality. Reality will always win, reality is going to win. We are going to win. Everything we've gone through since September 11th and before that's been the reality distortion field. The one that says there's no such thing as Islamic terrorism, colliding with reality. If there are days when you get up and think that it's hopeless, that people will never know the truth and will be going through the same motions 20 years from now, don't. Every lie that has been told, every media story lying about Islamic terrorism, lying about Hamas and Iran, every piece of propaganda used to support the narrative is the little Dutch boy with his finger holding back the flood. But the flood is coming. In fact, it's already here. When we speak the truth, we are on the side of reality. You're here because you choose to face reality, and that's the first step to victory. Remember that, the road has been a long one and it's not over, but the road to victory doesn't just happen in places like Iraq or Afghanistan. It begins in rooms like these with people like you. You may not think it can happen. Most people didn't believe the Soviet Union could fall. But when you get up close, you can sense the desperation at the top, and you can see the cracks slowly spreading, and you can recognize that the end is near. What you're witnessing is the last days of the Soviet Union when the government lied frantically and desperately about what was going on until the end came. The next generation of Islamic terrorism will crush the lie, and then we'll crush it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of the good fight. And remember, no matter how dark the hour seems, we are going to win.